Meantime, Baghdad stands defiant, Saddam showing no sign of accepting a public offer of exile from Bahrain, and his regime showing every sign of digging in. Even so, 17 Iraqi soldiers surrendered to American GIs today, eager to give up before the shooting starts. At the White House, the president is meeting with top aides and sending formal notice to Congress that counting on further diplomatic and other peaceful means is not going to be enough to counter the continuing threat posed by Iraq. Spokesman Ari Fleischer said the nation should prepare for the loss of American lives once the military effort begins to depose Saddam and recover weapons of mass destruction. That's a check of the headlines. I'm Christy Muzumeci. Now back to Hardball. Welcome back to Hardball. 90 minutes past the deadline for Saddam Hussein to leave Iraq or face military action. And across the Middle East, people are getting ready for war. NBC's Don Teague is in Kuwait City with the latest. Good evening, Chris. The sandstorm that blew through Kuwait early this morning and through today has mostly passed, but the real feeling here in Kuwait is that the big storm is still to come. All of a sudden, the most popular activity in Kuwait is leaving. In the northern Kuwaiti desert, tens of thousands of American troops spent today on the move, massing on the border with Iraq, poised for war at a moment's notice. With war thought to be just hours away, troops aren't the only ones planning to leave. Kuwait's airport was packed today. American and other expatriates and Kuwaitis who figure it's best to be somewhere else when hostilities kick off. The duty, the current situation, we are a little bit uh, uh, worried about the little kids and the children. That's why I'm sending them to Cairo. But most civilians in Kuwait are planning to stay put, hoping Saddam. Target Iraq. Here is Tom Brokaw. Good evening, everyone. It has been an evening of tense expectations. The 48-hour deadline for Saddam Hussein to leave Iraq has expired about an hour and 30 minutes ago now and we have reports that american warplanes could be in the air we're going to go to peter arnett who is now in baghdad where it is early thursday morning and air raid sirens are sounding across the capital city peter what are you hearing and what are you seeing i don't have contact peter arnett, can you hear me yes go ahead peter yeah, hello, Tom. I don't know if you can hear me, but the siren sounding all over Baghdad as of this moment. It's about an hour before dawn here. Siren sounding, but no sounds of missiles or any aircraft fire. This could be a pre-warning of an attack. No sign of any attack, but it could be a pre-warning. The sirens have now died down. In the Gulf War 12 years ago, there was a similar series of sirens before the actual bombing began. And Peter, what about the conditions on the ground in Baghdad? Uh, were you seeing any uh, overt signs of any aircraft defenses okay, being moved on? Okay, the first anti-aircraft fire I am seeing in the sky now directly in front of me, Tom, and the, and the eastern side of the city, scattered, scattered fire, not very visible, but the first scattered fire. And the city itself, a few police cars zooming through the streets, the lights of the city are still on. Other than that, no activity, but it's really get a sense here of an impending attack. All right, let's go to uh, NBC Jim Miklaszewski, who's at the Pentagon tonight. We're going to keep that picture of Baghdad live up for you about an hour before dawn there. Jim Miklaszewski at the Pentagon, what can you tell us? Well, Tom, uh, earlier this evening, uh, U.S. sources told NBC News that uh, it appeared that as many as a dozen B-52s had taken off from England. Now, the cover story apparently uh, out of that region was that they were on some kind of training mission or, or some unrelated mission to the uh, uh, possible uh, invasion of Iraq. Uh, but we were told uh, that it appeared that those bombers were indeed headed toward Iraq, but U.S. military officials are also saying tonight uh, that, uh, that what we may be seeing tonight 
could in fact be what they call a preliminary airstrikes or prepping the battlefield. It was thought that at some time uh, the U.S. military would launch uh, an increased number of airstrikes, uh, probably at some of the integrated missile defense systems in an attempt to take them down uh, before there was actual uh, any actual invasion. Uh, as, as of now, as we heard just a moment ago, the air raid sirens in Baghdad, uh, it, it is unclear as to uh, how extensive uh, any U.S. military operation uh, may be at this time. All right, thanks very much, NBC's Jim Mokoshevsky at the Pentagon. It's also worth noting that the president and Vice President Cheney remain at the White House tonight. Reporters who were there were told to stand by, not to go home. That didn't mean that there was any action that was imminent, but let's go back to Peter Arnett now. Hey, I got you. Uh, Peter, what can you tell us about what you're seeing now and what looks like pre-dawn skies over Baghdad? Well, what we have, the city has returned to calm, Tom. Five minutes ago, a series of loud sirens across the city, followed by some scattered anti-aircraft fire to the east of the city, then an explosion in the center could well have been an anti-aircraft gun firing. Now we're back to normal again. There, is a, there, are, there are police cars zooming about the town, but nothing right now. But clearly, this is a city on alert and waiting, Tom. All right, thanks very much, uh, Peter Arnett, who is a correspondent for National Geographic Explorer on assignment for NBC News. He was there, of course, in 1991 for CNN. As we look at the Iraqi capital, uh, this has been an evening that everyone has been waiting to arrive uh, because the president gave Saddam Hussein and his family 48 hours on Monday in a dramatic and sobering announcement from the White House that expired tonight. At 8 earlier, Uday, the president's uh, eldest son in Iraq, said that they had no intention whatsoever of leaving. Throughout the day, we heard from Iraqi officials, the Minister of Information, Tariq Aziz, who's the deputy prime minister, who appeared in military uniform and with a pistol, saying that he's ready to fight after there had been reports that he may be trying to escape the country. He said that was simply not true. Also seen from the Iraqi parliament, people chanting and cheering, saying that they were prepared to die for their great uncle, as Saddam Hussein likes to be called. Um, at, any, at any moment, let's go to the White House now, and uh, at any moment, we'll be hearing from the White House and Ari Fleischer, who is the president's spokesman. As I said earlier, uh, the correspondents were told to stand by, not to go home, to remain flexible. There's something called a lid. The lid was not on at the White House tonight. That meant that there could be additional news. But no one was talking. Vice President Cheney's in the White House with the President, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Richard Myers, were at the White House earlier, and um, they went back across the river to the Pentagon. I'm joined here in the studios as we continue to keep this picture up by General Barry McCaffrey, who led an armored assault during Operation Desert Storm. Uh, General Mike Short, who is a, a veteran of a lot of tactical aircraft and ran the bombing uh, campaign over Kosovo. And Vice Admiral Dennis McGinn, who was the former commander of the USS Ranger and a carrier pilot. Let's begin, uh, General McCaffrey, with you about timing. Um, this would be an unusual time. Generally, we make these strikes in the middle of the night if, in fact, something is going on now. Are you surprised that it could come during daylight hours? I think this would be one of the most unusual things I've ever encountered. You can't get strategic surprise. You can't get operational surprise. So if they're actually doing this, then they will absolutely have stunned the Iraqis. Not a one of them would assume this would happen. Just prior to dawn, uh, overwhelming surprise. And um, Mike Short, what would be your concerns as an Air Force commander of flying these kinds of missions during daylight, which we're about to see there? Tom, I would feel I'm giving up the advantage I've got. I own the night. Stealth assets, the B-2 and the 117. We've seen the pictures of downtown Baghdad. The, the sun is coming up. 117's, B-2's will be visible. I'd not want to give that up. Is, there, is it possible that what we're doing here is prepping the battlefield, as Jim Mikloshevsky said, and this is not the first wave of what will be the opening stage of the war? Tom, it's certainly possible, but we have, we have been told so many times, shock and awe, to just bomb a few targets and prep the battlefield and then back off for 14 hours while we wait for darkness is not my idea of shock and awe. 
And Admiral McGinn, you've been uh, both a carrier pilot and a commander uh, of, a, of a carrier. What about from the Navy's point of view? It's a long way to fly from the Gulf up to Baghdad, for one thing. It is, uh, but uh, thank goodness for the great uh, jointness of Navy and Air Force. We have great tanker support. Tom, I think if this is the beginning of the campaign, it's probably because of the investments we've made in technology, specifically standoff weapons and their accuracy and their rapid targeting since the Gulf War. All right, let's go to uh, NBC Jim McClashevsky, who's been listening to all of this, and he is uh, getting some information as well. Peter Arnett in Baghdad. Let's go to right. Peter. Tigris River around the presidential palace. This is clearly an indication the Iraqis are under the impression that they're under attack. Here again, you can hear the audio of that anti-aircraft fire. The Iraqis do have surface-to-air missiles uh, from Soviet-designed systems, SAM 2s, 3s, 8s. They have much anti-aircraft attack. Of uh, machine guns, heavier, heavier devices to fire into the sky. As of yet, no bombing, but intense fire that we're hearing right now. Mainly, this fire is on the southern uh, southern part of the city. Nothing in the center of the city yet, but the southern extremities of the city. Much fire here. I see some reflected light as well that looks like it could be some kind of ordinance exploding on the ground as well as the AAA fire that you're talking about. Are you seeing any of that, Peter? I'm not getting a very good signal from, uh, from good audio from you, Tom, if you're, if you're listening to me. But now very similar scenes from the Gulf War of 1991 and the bombing of 1998, traces going into the sky. Clearly, preparation, the radar, presumably the Iraqis have picked up something moving towards this location, and they're firing to intercept it All if right. they can. All right, Peter, I'm just going to continue to talk, and then when I call for you, I'll ask you to come in as best you can, even if you're only hearing me faintly. We want to remind everyone that uh, we do expect now, I'm told, to hear from the president before too long uh, at the White House. Uh, NBC, Jim McClashevsky, as you look at these pictures, tell us what you're hearing at the Pentagon. Well, Tom, uh, we're getting somewhat of a confused picture uh, from various sources in the U.S. government and the U.S. military. Uh, what we're told, Tom, uh, is that whatever is planned tonight, whether it's prepping the battlefield or whether it's the, the start of the war, uh, that the, the initial attack uh, that we're talking about tonight would apparently involve small numbers. That was, that was the description given to us a short time ago, ago small numbers of uh, a possible B-52 52s, possibly stealth fighters, even possibly cruise missiles. Uh, there were still some people, as, as of just a short time ago, here in the Pentagon, who were describing this still as prepping the battlefield. Now, uh, now I heard from our panel of experts early uh, that this is not shock and awe, but I can tell you that we were also advised very early on uh, that any invasion of Iraq by the U.S. would be totally unconventional. A lot of this would be unexpected. And there were, there were times, we are told, uh, when the U.S. would actually uh, launch airplanes at Iraq, in, in which uh, it, it, it in fact may not be the start of the war, uh, but just an attempt uh, to light up the Iraqi def air defense systems, see what they've got, uh, and, and keep the Iraqis off guard. Uh, now, at this point, it, it is totally unclear uh, as to what the Iraqis were shooting at exactly, uh, but we were told much, uh, earlier this evening that the airstrikes if there are airstrikes against Baghdad tonight, uh, would involve small numbers of U.S. military aircraft and possibly cruise missiles. Uh, thanks very much, NBC. Jim McLeshevsky, what about the role of the B-52 here, General Short? Uh, Tom, the B-52 is our cruise missile carrier. It carries 20 uh, conventional air launch cruise missiles. This is the heavy 2,000-pound warhead, the penetrator, and the deep warhead capability. So we may be shooting 
maybe 200 of these things at deep and, and, and buried targets, taking down some radars, going after some command and control nodes, and again, as Jim said, lighting up, the, lighting up their radars, see what they do. Uh, we're gonna, about to learn a lot more. Here's Ari Fleischer at the White the House. The opening now. stages of the disarmament of the Iraqi regime have begun. The president will address the nation at 10.15. Well, the war is underway, but it is not underway in, in a manner in which we anticipated. Uh, we were told that there would be shock and awe. Obviously, uh, this is part of a new way of waging war against Iraq. Uh, we have an air campaign that appears to be underway tonight. Um, AAA fire has been seen and heard in the skies over Baghdad, but we have not seen any of that violent explosive firepower that we witnessed in 1991, but it could be just moments away. If the president is coming out at 10.15, I don't think he's coming out to talk about the lights being on in the city of Baghdad. So there's a good deal going on there right now in the skies over Iraq and in that theater. What it is exactly, we don't know yet, but we'll invite you to stay with us as we watch these pictures of the capital city. And let's go to Pierre Arnett now, who is standing by uh, at a hotel room window looking outside and watching and listening. Peter, any more signs of any aircraft fire? Yes, well, about 30 seconds ago, Tom, the sounds of several planes flying over the city and what seemed to be explosions in the distance out, 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 out excuse me, outskirts of Baghdad. To the north, we're hearing more anti-aircraft fire. That may be where the actual location of that bombing was, if it indeed was bombing. But high-flying airplanes, we heard just now about a minute ago, several of them over Baghdad. All right, thanks, Peter. Right now, it's back to being relatively quiet. All right, thanks, Peter. I, I think it's worth pointing out again uh, that uh, in some of the pictures that we were seeing earlier that you probably couldn't see, there was reflected light in the distance that looked like something was going off mm -hmm. on the ground. Yeah. It could have been a bomb of some kind. Uh, NBC, Jim Klaszewski at the Pentagon now. Jim, you have additional information for us? Okay, bye. He's on the phone. He just said goodbye yeah. to someone. <laughs> Tom, I was just on the phone a second ago. Uh, here's what's in the package tonight. Uh, there are going to be small numbers, as I said earlier, F-117 stealth fighters, uh, the dozen or so B-52 bombers out of England, and uh, also a package, probably a small package, of sea-launched cruise missiles uh, from U.S. ships in the Persian Gulf. We're told tonight that there will be two sets of attacks tonight, uh, and they're both against sets of leadership targets inside Baghdad. Not certain to exactly what those leadership targets are, but we can expect two bombing runs uh, with F-117 stealth fighters, the B-52s and, and sea launch cruise missiles uh, against leadership targets uh, clearly underway uh, at this time. All right, thanks very much, NBC Jim McLeshevsky. Watching all of this as well, the man who was in charge of the American war in 1990, 1991, General Norman Schwarzkopf, General, is it possible that what they have here is a plan underway to try to take out Saddam Hussein and the members of his leadership with some surgical strikes, pause for a moment, and then see what happens? I thought we had General Norman Schwarzkopf, but perhaps we don't. You do. I'm on. Okay. Yeah, I, I just heard uh, just only part of the report. Uh, that, that, that Jim had gotten from the military. Well, let me, let me take you through it if I can then. Uh, Jim was saying that we're going to have a small package tonight of F-117s, B-52s, a smaller number, cruise missiles, two sets of targets, primarily leadership targets that are in Baghdad, and that it will come in two waves. We know that the president's going to come on at 10:15, so the war effectively is underway. Is it possible that they're thinking that they can take out the leadership in surgical strikes, pause, hoping that the country then will rally around the United States or that the other defenses will collapse. Yeah, well, you, as you can understand, this is completely opposite what we did in Desert Storm. We, in fact, massed all of our forces and came screaming in at 2.30 at, at in the morning with everything we had. So this is a very, very interesting tactic, and, and it seems like, uh, just as you say, uh, they, maybe they hope to, to really surprise some of the leadership targets and, and catch them before the onslaught happened and they all went underground. 
Barry McCaffrey, you're here as well. Uh, what would you think of that kind of an, uh, an approach? Well, you know, I, I'm actually in shock and awe myself. I can't imagine, that, you know, we've been talking about this for three weeks, so they certainly surprised me and I think these other two flag officers. Uh, that may be exactly what they're up to. Uh, you know, the intel has been trying to find the leadership targets for the last 30 days. Huge effort to vacuum up data. And if this is what we're up to and it works, it would be a terrific gift to the Iraqi people. Uh, not only that, and we don't know exactly what is going on here, but the fact is that it would be a political stroke as well because it would mean that there would be a minimal amount of civilian loss and mm -hmm. it would be that the target is the Iraqi leadership and Saddam Hussein and it's not war against the Muslim population mm -hmm. of Iraq. But it, as I say, we don't know exactly what is going on. We only know that there are planes in the air that Baghdad apparently has been hit at least uh, on the periphery of it and maybe some of those leadership targets are out there and that some fire has been uh, sent off as well. Uh, Mike Short, tell us a little more about what other kinds of assets that we have behind these F-117s and the B-52s and the cruise missiles that M Jim Miklaszewski talked about. Well, Tom, I think they're probably being supported by jamming aircraft, EA-6Bs that would jam the radar systems and, and prevent them from acquiring the targets if they were able to do that probably also uh, F-16s and F-18s that shoot missiles that attack radar sites, the harm missile, and I think you'll probably see that escorting these aircraft in. So this will not simply be the strike assets that Jim talked about. I think there'll be support assets with them to get them in and get them out. All right, well, we've just gotten a report, in fact, from some of our sources that a U.S. official has told NBC News that radar jamming and other electronic attack aircraft began operations at 9.31 Eastern Time about 20 minutes ago. That's just about the time that we saw the planes over Baghdad. The initial strikes will include a combination of B-1 bombers, B-2s, B-52s, air and sea launch cruise missiles, standoff weapons, F-117s attacking key nodes of air defense, and National Command in and around Baghdad and also in the south, which is where the ground war mm -hmm. is going to begin. Is that in keeping with what you would expect, Admiral McGinn? It is. Uh, the timing is a little bit off. I share a little bit of that shock and awe that General McCaffrey uh, mentioned before, but I think that's uh, the whole point of it, that uh, we shouldn't fight the war we fought uh, 12 years ago, and uh, we should go after their weaknesses. And we are fighting this in a supercharged political context, after all. The United States is out there with Great Britain, mm -hmm. with a lot of people being very critical of the idea that the United States is going to war, and what many see is a preemptive strike, others going so far as to say this is the act of an imperial nation. So there are political sensitivities that are going to be involved here as well. Let's, let's go to NBC's Campbell Brown now, who is at the White House. Campbell, what are you hearing there? Tom, we are expecting, as you know, to hear from the president at 10.15 Eastern time. We expect that that address will be from the Oval Office. That's what officials had originally said as they have been planning this. Uh, this is in a speech that they have been working on for some time now. It was described to us as being very similar to how the president addressed the nation after military strikes began in Afghanistan. You'll recall it was about noontime on a Sunday the strikes began. The president spoke to the nation about an hour after that. He is going to try to convey to the American people tonight, uh, first of all, telling them that the strikes are underway, what's involved, but also about the sacrifice involved. It will be the first time he's really talked about that at greater length than we heard in his original speech. Um, so that's going to be more of a focus, especially given in mind what we're hearing from officials over and over again, that this, as opposed to Afghanistan, is going to be a much uh, more conventional war, but also a much more dangerous war and uh, in terms of casualties. Now, there have been a lot of indications that something was coming this evening. Um, the president working the phones most of the afternoon to call world leaders to put them on notice that military action may be imminent. In addition, all the top military commanders were here with the president, Secretary Rumsfeld, General Myers. Until late this evening, uh, Vice President Cheney is still here at the White House, remained here all evening. All of the key staff were uh, with the president in the Oval Office until late in the evening, so no one uh, was getting any sense that they should be leaving work tonight. There was definitely a feeling around the White House that something was going on. Um, 
I think the timing, as, as you've heard other people say, caught many people by surprise because the expectation is always there that this would happen in the evening. But uh, the president has always conveyed his impatience with uh, the UN and with the lengthy process that went into disarming Saddam. So it follows with what the president has always said that the moment this deadline passed, he would be ready to take action immediately. Tom? Thank you very much, NBC's Campbell Brown. There has been so much talk in this administration about the United States reorganizing itself to fight the special wars of the 21st century, the war on terrorism, rogue states with weapons of mass destruction. That certainly was the case in Afghanistan, in which we saw special operations officers on horseback riding to battle with a coalition that was put together with millions of dollars delivered by CIA agents and CIA agents involved as well. We have been told in the past several days that CIA operatives, at least, are in the south of Iraq where they are spreading money around and encouraging the regular army units to lay down their weapons to put them in a place and to point them in the right direction and then go to their barracks and stay just there. So what we're seeing here may be the first stages of another form of unexpected and unconventional warfare. U.S. officials are telling NBC News tonight that the attacks earlier today are intended to flush out the Iraqi leadership to provide a confusing picture of the main attack, which will come later, possibly tomorrow, and whether that comes uh, all at once with uh, heavier air attacks and ground attacks, we don't know for sure. Let's, uh, here's the tape of what was going on in Baghdad earlier. You can see any aircraft fire modest by Baghdad standards, really. And air raid sirens were sounding. That's from Al Jazeera, I believe, uh, Arab television, which is another uh, component in this war. Uh, the technology of communications is so much different. Every screen around the world probably tonight carrying these pictures at this hour. It will be the most televised event probably in the history of mankind, this war that is playing out live. Monty Miggs is uh, standing by. He uh, is a retired uh, Army general, of course, who was a colonel during Operation Desert Storm, leading an armored assault across the desert sands. Uh, he's standing at a map now, and he's going to give us some perspective on where the American ground forces are and how far it is to Baghdad and what's critical between where they are now and where they need to get to. Monty? Tom, it's 400 miles from Kuwait to Baghdad, and you've got to go through some pretty rugged terrain here that's uh, very wet, it's cross-compartmented, and it'll take some work, but our people know how to do it. I'm, I'm intrigued by the combination we're seeing tonight, perhaps a decapitating attack, as General Schwarzkopf pointed out, before people actually leave and go underground. And who knows what's happening in the ground, perhaps activity to invest Basra or very active special forces sector sequence of pictures coming from Baghdad. Some of these are from stationary cameras that uh, networks have placed there. Some of them, one of those shots at least, came from Al Jazeera, the uh, Arab news station. Um, Walt Rogers, was there, has there been anything in the last hour, two, three hours that suggested to you that this was about to begin? Well, we saw a lot of refueling in the ta uh, with tanks and armored vehicles here last night. There's been a lot of activity. However, we remain in the same attack position, the attack formation that we were in probably five hours ago. Again, we do not have a clear indication that even though we're in this attack position, we're going to be ordered forward at this point. The Army is still waiting orders to cross the border, which is very, very close to where we are. Waiting orders to cross that border. The soldiers are more than ready to go. And as I say, uh, the commander of the uh, 7th Cavalry, Lieutenant Colonel Terry Farrell says he does not expect a terribly large amount of a res resistance uh, initially the first uh, 100 kilometers or so, but as the uh, 7th Cavalry gets closer to Baghdad, that's when they say the resistance will increase. He urged his soldiers to fight hard because he said the Iraqis will be fighting hard. They have to expect that, although one interesting thing he said was uh, that once you get into Iraq, you can still expect the Iraqis are going to be glad to see you. They're going to be more friendly Iraqis welcoming you than those who are hostile uh, trying to fight you.
Aaron? Uh, Walt, thank you. We'll find out. Uh, it appears we're going to find that out plenty soon enough. Thank you, John King at the White House. What do you got? Well, Aaron, a curious point to the speculation you were discussing with Jamie McIntyre earlier. Shortly after the deadline lapsed, Ari Fleischer came into the briefing room and told reporters that Andy Card, the White House Chief of Staff, had checked with the CIA and the National Security Agency, and they had informed him that they had information that Saddam Hussein had not left Iraq and was still in the country. And that information was relayed to President Bush, obviously a critical item of issue at the time of the deadline passing. What the target of opportunity is, as Jamie described it, we do not know, but it would certainly be interesting if it indeed is Saddam Hussein or any key member of the Iraqi leadership, because just moment, just weeks ago in testimony to Congress, Secretary of State Powell was asked by Senator Fritz Hollings of South Carolina, why our war, why don't we just kill him? And Secretary Powell responded, Senator, that would assume that we know where he is, yes. and we don't. Well, and as you know, and as I, I suspect many, if not most of our viewers know, uh, he is a man, Saddam Hussein is a man who rarely sleeps in the same bed two nights in a row. He has many bunkers and palaces, uh, residences uh, all over the country. Uh, he is surrounded by a vast security apparatus to protect him. He is not an easy target. There is also, as I suspect many of you know, there is a literal, literal prohibition against assassinating a foreign leader but once war begins once war begins that prohibition is no longer in play uh, under international law uh, in Kuwait Christian Amanpour and Wolf Blitzer are there I know uh, both of you are working very hard to find out what you can what can you tell us Christian go ahead well earlier today we were talking to a senior UK official UK is going to be in charge of liberating, if you like, the southern part of Iraq. And they were talking about what we might expect at the beginning of a campaign. And we were led to believe that the full-scale beginning that we'd been told about was not going to be immediately after the, uh, after the deadline passed. We were being told that uh, it was going to be a major effort to target military targets only, to rein in quite heavy uh, uh, bombs, precision-guided bombs from land and air and sea, and to try to separate those targets, military targets, from any kind of civilian or indeed any kind of Iraqi military that doesn't want to fight. They're very determined, they say, to try to uh, show the Iraqis from the beginning that they are not out to kill or, or maim unneededly any Iraqi civilians or indeed soldiers who don't want to fight, nor do they want to cause enormous damage to the infrastructure. For instance, we were told today that let's say they want to take a bridge out, instead of hitting the bridge several times like they did 12 years ago, they might put a crater at one end of the bridge on the ground and at the other end and may even leave the bridge standing. Uh. So we're being told that they will be quite a heavy aerial and uh, land-based, uh, rather sea-based bombardment, uh, but their targets are quite precise. As you can see and now... And if I could just weigh in, Aaron... I'm sorry, just, Wolf, just hang, can you just hang with me for one second, Wolf. Uh, just again, we're just a little bit past 10. You're looking at pictures of Baghdad. Uh, we know, because the president's spokesman has told us so, that the opening stages of the disarmament of Iraq is underway. Those were his words. Jamie McIntyre has reported that it was a cruise missile strike at a target of opportunity, uh, we, we, I think, can flesh that out a little bit more. Jamie, um, at the Pentagon, tell me. Well, Aaron, a little bit uh, of a clarification. We're still trying to figure out exactly the nature of this, quote, target of opportunity. It has been described to me now as a leadership target, which, again, makes it even more intriguing it sure about does. what it is it could possibly be a leadership target. Another uh, defense official said to me that it was not a target that suddenly appeared. It's one they've known about for a while, but it was one that they decided to, uh, to take a strike at with uh, these cruise missiles. So there just are a little piece of the puzzle. We are being told now this was a leadership target. I apologize for stepping on you there. There are perhaps a hundred or so uh, people that the United States would have insisted leave Sorry. Iraq along with uh, Saddam Hussein and his sons. Whether that was any of them were involved in this, we don't know. We'll find out soon enough, we expect. Um, Wolf Blitzer, we interrupted you a moment ago in Kuwait. 
Uh, Aaron, uh, first of all, here in Kuwait, it's just uh, obviously just early hours of the morning, very quiet. There's no visible signs whatsoever here of any serious military activity in Kuwait City, although we are relatively far away from the northern part of Kuwait along the border, of course, with Iraq. That's where there are uh, more than 100,000 U.S. troops, another 30,000 or so British troops. They're obviously uh, gearing up to move into Iraq at some point, precisely when, of course, remains up in the air. I also want to caution our viewers to, uh, to appreciate the fact that while we do have cameras, live cameras around uh, Baghdad, and we're seeing those live pictures, we don't necessarily have live cameras elsewhere around Iraq. And Iraq is a huge country the size of about California. So while there may be a strike, there may be anti-aircraft batteries going off in Baghdad, we have no idea what may be happening, happening around the other parts of Iraq where there are what the U.S. military calls these targets of opportunity, whether there are also airstrikes underway elsewhere in Iraq or whether this is strictly limited to Baghdad where we do have these stationary cameras, as you point out, which can detect what's going on to a certain degree. We also have our own Nick Robertson in Baghdad as well. Aaron? Thank you, Wolf. Uh, again, we're seeing some pictures of Baghdad. We have yet to see uh, anything that indicates uh, missile. Everyone, uh, I jumped out. Uh, I'm standing on the balcony uh, overlooking Baghdad. I have a very clear view on the, from the 14th floor. Then there was a, a about a 10-minute burst of anti-aircraft fire. You could see the actual uh, tracers going up through the sky. Uh, you, I couldn't hear any jets or any planes, so I had no idea what they were firing at. Then at a later stage, I did hear a, a jet pass over. Then it went calm. And then in the last few, few minutes, uh, a little bit outside of the city, uh, you, I heard another series of explosions. What exactly uh, they were firing at, it's not sure. But again, uh, the second time I did hear a plane flying overhead. This is, of course, very different than the opening of the last war, when, which in itself was something uh, somewhat misleading because the anti-aircraft fire that the Iraqis loose off trying to put up this curtain of lead from whatever against whatever is incoming has not been evident this time. So you haven't seen a whole lot of anti-aircraft going off, am I right? No, this was not the, the massive anti-aircraft display. It seems like, and I don't know, I, I, mean, I just t can tell you and only speculate based on what I saw, that this was some sort of test or that, you know, mm -hmm. one aircraft was sent in to see what kind of thing they've got. There was not a massive uh, uploading of anti-aircraft, nor did I hear any major explosions of any uh, firing. Uh, or I, I couldn't see anything go up in flames. There's no plumes of smoke uh, around. So... It's hard to know exactly what had happened, but something certainly did and is continuing to, uh, seems to be continuing. I think I'm hearing explosions again. Okay, Richard, you listen for yes, a second. I am in the south. Richard, you listen for a second, and we'll come right back to you. But I want to go to John McCrethy at the Pentagon, because we've all been trying to sort out <clears throat> basically what uh, Mr. Fleischer said, the president's spokesman, when he said, John, that the opening stages of the disarmament of the Iraqi regime have begun. This does not, I don't think, necessarily means that an overall attack has begun, right? No, it does not. Uh, what it does represent, Peter, is the kind of flexible approach to this situation that the administration said they were going to take in the first place. Uh, this is a barrage of cruise missiles. There was a meeting at the White House this afternoon, uh, and although the plan uh, called for the opening uh, major air offensive to begin in several days. Uh, they discovered or believed that they had a, uh, a target of opportunity to get some of the leadership uh, either through, well, various kinds of intelligence that they had been gathering. Uh, they determined that they were in a particular location and they went after it with a barrage of cruise missiles. Uh, they turned this around in a big hurry. Uh, and they have begun this campaign uh, way ahead of where they were planning to. Uh, I think it's open to question whether or not uh, they are now going to kick off some other aspects or if they are going mm. to slip back into the major plan uh, that they had laid down uh, previously. Well, it's a tremendously interesting question because everything was so key. There was such a plan that the, uh, the ground units began uh, to move towards the Iraqi-Kuwaiti border this evening, all very timed, very carefully to move on the southern city of Basra immediately. John, if they decide, not that the element of surprise is a huge component here because the Iraqis knew the United States was coming, if they, if they decide to play it by ear now, how much of a spanner, how much of a monkey wrench does that throw into the overall planning? 
Oh, I, I think it would complicate uh, quite a few things, Peter, uh, to, to deal with the kind of orchestration that uh, is required with so many troops coming from so many different directions. Uh, I think it will be extremely difficult uh, for them to execute the entire plan just at the drop of a hat. Uh, so I, I think they're going to probably continue to look for uh, moments of opportunity when they feel they can strike at the leadership uh, and go after that. This is also uh, another way of uh, forcing the Iraqis to light up their air defense system, gives the U.S. a very, very good look uh, at the different air defense frequencies. Uh, this is something the U.S. was probably going to do anyway, to do a feint, uh, to run aircraft right up uh, to Baghdad and turn around and go away. It, it uh, may, it may, it, John, it may be, it may be, I just want to offer up an instruction to Richard Engel, if you mind. Richard Engel, I know you can hear me in Baghdad. If you wouldn't mind turning on, if you haven't already. <laughs> have you turned it on already? Okay. Um, I have. I wasn't trying to... Uh why don't you continue your conversation? I'll try and find this radio. Uh, you're trying to find the uh, the report that the American yeah. military is broadcasting on the radio? Exactly. So if you'll listen for a second and see what the tone of, of the broadcasting is on Iraqi state radio, we'll go on and come back to you in just a second. Uh, John McQuaffey again. And because they had a shot at getting somebody, mm -hmm. whether it was Saddam Hussein, we don't know. And so they launched, and then that may have triggered successive waves as well. Uh, someone who knows a lot about flying a uh, tactical fighter over a hostile territory is Senator John McCain, who has been a vigorous supporter of the president's policy in Iraq. And it was just 30 years ago this week that he returned home from his long and punishing uh, imprisonment in, in, in North Vietnam. General McCain, I know that you're still a student of military strategy. Are you surprised by the way this is beginning? Yes, I am. Uh, but when you think about it, I think it's uh, logical in that we have such uh, uh, precision weaponry, number one. Number two is that um, we must have some pretty good intelligence information. And number three, um, uh, this uh, it has the possibility of decapitating, uh, which would then make, uh, I think, the challenge uh, significantly less difficult. And I was interested in the report you just heard about Basra, because I think if they crumble at Basra, where they're known to be have less control, uh, then it could mean that uh, this task may be much less difficult than, than we had anticipated. And political consideration has always been a major component. It is in any war, but it especially in this war because of the fact that we were going in there uh, with just the British effectively as our allies with a lot of feeling that we had overstepped. And I think that it's uh, even more critical, as you say, because if we can minimize the loss of civilian lives and, and minimize those casualties, I think it will have a very beneficial effect on how uh, this conflict is judged. Uh, clearly, neither time uh, nor expenditure of funds or lives is on our side. And so this may be a, a bit of a roll of the dice, although I don't know, I'm not sure what you have to lose since we have sufficient forces to pursue what what most of us had anticipated, and if it succeeds, it could really circumvent uh, a lot of difficulties. But uh, very interesting evening. Thanks very much, uh, Senator John McCain of could Arizona. I just say, could I yeah. just say, Tom, uh, our young men and women are in harm's way now. We wish them every success. All Americans support them and are behind them, and we know they will do well, and we know they're the very best we have. However anyone feels about this war I know across the country uh, at this critical hour, that's a consensus point of view. Uh, thank you very much, Senator John McCain. Uh, three absolutely horrendous explosions were taken, were heard tonight in the city of Arvkanhar, which is in southern Iraq, uh, the city of Fa, actually, also the town of Arvkanhar. It's in the Abadan province in southern Iran in the first minutes of Thursday morning. That's according to uh, the Islamic Republic news agency. So that would be outside of, um, no, that's in Iraq, but reported by the Iranian news agencies. So there's a lot of stuff going on that we can see tonight. We'll continue to look at uh, the live pictures of Baghdad and tell you that we'll hear from the president now in about two and a half minutes, as he has already said, 
that the first stages of disarming Iraq are underway. The official name of the operation is Iraqi Freedom. NBC Jim Mikloshevsky is at the Pentagon. Jim, so we're getting a little more clarification from U.S. military sources. Apparently, what was going on initially is a, a serious and extensive prepping of the battlefield in the no-fly zone in southern Iraq. That was the initial operation tonight. But at some point, U.S. intelligence detected what they called a target of opportunity. The hint here that it could have been a senior or very senior member of the Iraqi regime. Nobody's using the names. Patience. God protect, us. God protect our leader. That just read a few minutes ago a message from Uday Saddam Hussein, the president's eldest son, read on Iraqi radio this morning. That's what people here will be hearing as they also hear the anti-aircraft gunfire in this city. Aaron? Nick, Nick, thank you. Thursday morning, now just before, just after uh, 6 o'clock, in the morning, the President of the United States, uh, for the second time, is about to tell the country that it is at war. Uh, he did it on a Sunday when the war in Afghanistan began in those months after 9-11. And in just a moment, he is about to do it again. Six, Here is the President. Five, four, three, two, one. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. More than 35 countries are giving crucial support, from the use of naval and air bases, to help with intelligence and logistics, to the deployment of combat units. Every nation in this coalition has chosen to bear the duty and share the honor of serving in our common defense. To all the men and women of the United States Armed Forces now in the Middle East, the peace of a troubled world and the hopes of an oppressed people now depend on you. That trust is well placed. The enemies you confront will come to know your skill and bravery. The people you liberate will witness the honorable and decent spirit of the American military. In this conflict, America faces an enemy who has no regard for conventions of war or rules of morality. Saddam Hussein has placed Iraqi troops and equipment in civilian areas, attempting to use innocent men, women, and children as shields for his own military, a final atrocity against his people. I want Americans and all the world to know that coalition forces will make every effort to spare innocent civilians from harm. A campaign on the harsh terrain of a nation as large as California could be longer and more difficult than some predict. And helping Iraqis achieve a united, stable, and free country will require our sustained commitment. We come to Iraq with respect for its citizens for their great civilization and for the religious faiths they practice. We have no ambition in Iraq except to remove a threat and restore control of that country to its own people. I know that the families of our military are praying that all those who serve will return safely and soon. Millions of Americans are praying with you for the safety of your loved ones and for the protection of the innocent. For your sacrifice, you have the gratitude and respect of the American people. And you can know that our forces will be coming home as soon as their work is done. Our nation enters this conflict reluctantly, yet our purpose is sure. The people of the United States and our friends and allies will not live at the mercy of an outlaw regime that threatens the peace with weapons of mass murder. We will meet that threat now with our Army, Air Force, Navy, Coast Guard, and Marines so that we do not have to meet it later with armies of firefighters and police and doctors on the streets of our cities. Now that conflict has come, the only way to limit its duration is to apply decisive force. And I assure you, this will not be a campaign of half measures, and we will accept no outcome but victory. 
my fellow citizens, the dangers to our country and the world will be overcome. We will pass through this time of peril and carry on the work of peace. We will defend our freedom. We will bring freedom to others and we will prevail. May God bless our country and all who defend her. The President of the United States in taking little more than four minutes to say that we are in the early stages of the effort to disarm Iraq. Uh, selected targets are being hit, said the President, to undermine the ability, as you see pictures of Baghdad, to undermine the ability of the Iraqi forces to stop the assault, the broad assault, as the President put it, which is coming, though has not yet begun. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Jamie? I'm sorry, Aaron? I'm sorry. CNN has been told that this was in fact a decapitation strike aimed at killing or at the very least sending a powerful message to Saddam Hussein. This strike, which was uh, employed cruise missiles and F-117 stealth fighters over Baghdad, was targeting a location where it was believed Saddam Hussein and other Iraqi leadership were located. Now, these kind of, this kind of intelligence is always somewhat problematic, and the U.S. military is well aware that uh, this kind of a strike using cruise missiles and uh, uh, precision-guided bombs from the air uh, it has a low probability of success in targeting an individual. But nevertheless, apparently there was enough intelligence for the United States to attempt a decapitation strike uh, to take out Saddam Hussein even before the war began. Uh, this is not the beginning of the war, according to a U.S. Uh, official uh, telling CNN, but in fact it was a target of opportunity that the U.S. felt it could not pass up. The intelligence would not last long enough for them to wait for the scheduled start of the war. Uh, so, uh, Aaron, very dramatic information here, and of course now we want to know the results of this strike, and at this point we have no idea. And that may take some time to know, but again, uh, as Jamie reported, it appears to be a, a, an, a, an attack or uh, uh, a leadership bunker or a place where perhaps Saddam Hussein was, perhaps he and the government uh, of Iraq were, were hiding out, trying to stay safe, uh, attacked by cruise missiles. The United States government, the United States military has done this sort of thing before with less success. It's a not an easy thing to do, and we won't know for some time if it was successful, maybe a long time. Uh, Nick, what are you hearing in Baghdad, Nick Robertson? Aaron, the anti-aircraft gunfire uh, picking up again at this time. Very interesting that the target of opportunity struck apparently uh, President Saddam Hussein, possibly uh, somewhere he was believed to be. One remembers only a few hours ago when the rumor circulated uh, that Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz might have been killed or defected. Iraq was very swift within half an hour putting Tariq Aziz on international television so that everyone could see not only in Iraq but around the world that this rumor wasn't true. Um, possibly uh, an indication here, President Saddam Hussein may himself seek to disprove any rumor or any indication or any thought amongst his followers that uh, this strike may have been successful. Uh, he may uh, choose to do as he did in the, uh, the, day, uh, the day the Gulf War started in 1991, then he chose to speak on Iraqi television. That is something we may see later today. Certainly, for now, the anti-aircraft gunfire here is sporadic. It appears to be not coming from the center of the city, perhaps a little bit out of the center. The skies above the city beginning to clear a little, the clouds opening to allow through some blue skies. Still a little hazy, the visibility here, Aaron. We see, um, Nick, and I know you can't, so I'll just tell you what we're seeing in these pictures that we're able now to uh, establish again from Baghdad. There is some traffic, not a lot, but there is some traffic on the street. It does not look to us to be military vehicles, though some of it might be. Um, but there is still some traffic moving as we approach about 6.30 in the morning in Baghdad. Nick, uh, stay with us uh, for as long as you can hold the phone line. Uh, John King at the White House, the president made all of the points that he has in many respects been making for the last several uh, weeks, if not months. This is not a war against Islam. Aaron, only four minutes from the uh, president, as you know. John. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, Aaron. John, John King, can you hear me? I hear you fine. 
Um, I was saying the president was making a lot of the points that he has been making for a long time. This is not a war on the Iraqi population, not a war on Islam. It is a war on Saddam Hussein and his regime. And in that, and in only four minutes, as you noted, the president touching on that important political message aimed at the citizens of Iraq and more broadly the Arab street across the Middle East. He said the United States has no ambition in Iraq. It simply wants to free and liberate its people and remove a tyrant from power. The president making no secret that the goal is regime change. Also a political message to the people of the United States, though, Mr. Bush saying this conflict could be longer and more difficult than some predicted and would require a long and sustained effort to build up a new Iraq in the wake of this war. So Mr. Bush speaking both directly to the Arab citizens of the Middle East, also to the citizens here at home in laying out the early hours of what he promised would be a campaign using decisive force. We are witnessing the early moments of the war in Iraq, a much more controversial war than the president launched in October 2001 against the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. And in this campaign to remove Saddam Hussein from power, we are seeing the first test of this very controversial Bush administration policy in which this president says he has the right as commander-in-chief of the United States to attack a nation if he perceives it to be a threat against the United States, even if it has not attacked the United States. Again, as you look at Baghdad, it is eerie when you consider that it's clear from the president's words, the president's words, the early stages of the disarmament of Iraq have begun. The war, whether it is the full massive rollout that we all anticipated and were told to expect, or something of a smaller scale, as you look at Baghdad, it is quiet and to our eye, as calm as calm can be. Now there may be parts of Baghdad itself where that is not true. Uh, we have a small number of cameras and they certainly don't cover the large city or the large large country, as you've heard many times, a country the size of, of California. Uh, but uh, again, you don't see, um, although we, we thought we heard some loudspeakers uh, uh, coming from the city a while ago, um, you don't see any sense of panic in the city, any sense of movement in the city, or frankly, any sense of war in the city. General Clark, your eye on these matters is far sharper than I. What do you see? Well, you can't see anything in Baghdad right now. It looks like there's some lights on, so they haven't executed a blackout of the city. Um, you, we haven't heard any sirens recently. The shooting has stopped, so that means there's good command and control or some command and control over the air defense, so we haven't taken out all those air defense assets yet. And um, it sounds to me like it was precisely what we uh, were speculating on, Aaron, that they had an opportunity to strike at the leadership, and they had planned to be ready if they had such an opportunity. They had it, they struck. Uh, hopefully it'll have some impact, but um, as has been observed, it's probably not the main effort at this point. But it is underway, whatever it is, it has started. That much is clear from both the events on the ground in Baghdad and from the words of the President of the United States. In the Kuwaiti desert, literally hundreds of thousands of American soldiers and Marines have been waiting now for some weeks for a moment that is about to unfold. That much is clear. Walt Rogers is one of the many CNN correspondents who is, and you'll hear this term a lot, embedded with these units. He has been with them, lived with them, and will travel with them and report on them. And Walt Rogers joins us now from the desert in Kuwait. Walt? Hello, Aaron. I think what we can say at this point is that the U.S. Army, and particularly the 7th Cavalry, is tugging at the leash to be released. But this, again, as the president said, was a selective strike. The army is still sitting in northern Kuwait. It has not been ordered into southern Iraq yet. That's the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, this unit, the 7th Cavalry, uh, which is the uh, scouting unit, can move very, very quickly. But again, the army remains in Kuwait. It has not been ordered into Iraq. Uh, what the president ordered was a selective air strike. Joining me now is the uh, uh, Apache Troop Commander, Captain Clay Lyle, uh, 7th Cavalry. Uh, Captain Lyle, uh, we're sitting here waiting. Do you have any indication uh, what your orders are going to be and when? What happens when you get the order to go? Begin by telling us that. Uh, currently, none of my orders have changed. Uh, we have been and we remain ready. Uh, the soldiers' morale is high. Uh, we are well trained and equipped. And uh, uh, this is news to me. I know uh, the president will act in our best interest, uh, as well as all my higher commanders. Last night, the uh, CO of this unit, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Colonel Farrell, was telling the soldiers to expect to fight. Um, what, how do you see the battle unfolding from your point of view? 
Uh, we just, uh, we've uh, looked at the threat in that country uh, from all the different elements that are there, have been in place to do with the regime, uh, and we just, uh, we're prepared to deal with whatever we come up, uh, wherever we encounter, to try to handle the situation, but uh, try to view ourselves liberating the people of Iraq uh, and, and trying to remove that regime uh, not invading Iraq, uh, how, not fighting the people of Iraq. How powerful a military force is the U.S. Army going to throw at the Iraqis once the order comes to charge? Well, I'm sure uh, our superiors and the president will use uh, everything at his disposal to no, ensure our safety. No, but I'm talking about the Army. And, tell, tell us about the Army. How much punch does this Army have? My, uh, my troop, this squadron, uh, the 3rd Infantry Division, have uh, the best equipment in the world. Uh, we were trained. We've been here in the country training and acclimatizing uh, for uh, quite a while now. The M1A1 tank and the uh, Bradley Apaches and uh, Kiowa Warrior helicopters, uh, we're ready and uh, we can deal with whatever threat we encounter. And what sort of resistance do you expect once you uh, cross the border? It, it's, uh, it's hard to tell how the uh, individual Iraqi soldier, what, uh, when he encounters American forces, uh, the decision he'll make. I hope he makes the right decision and uh, surrenders to the uh, nearest American soldier. Captain Clay Lyle, the commander of Apache Troop, U.S. 7th Cavalry, saying still not sure what the Army will face once it crosses the border. Again, the dogs of war have not been unleashed down here yet, but the 7th Cavalry is ready. Aaron? Uh, thank you, Walt. Walt Rogers, and we'll be back to you. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon. Uh, you're able to continue doing some reporting here, uh, picking up pieces. What do you have? We're, we're slowly piecing it together, Aaron. We now know that this uh, strike was carried out by uh, more than uh, uh, a dozen or two dozen cruise missiles fired from ships both in the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. So those cruise missiles came at Baghdad from two different directions. In addition, F-117 stealth fighters, uh, with, uh, which can each carry two satellite-guided bombs, were also involved in the strike, which, sources tell CNN, was in fact a decapitation attempt. That is, a, an attempt to take out Iraqi President Saddam Hussein and some of his leadership at a location where U.S. intelligence indicated he may have been. Now, this uh, thinking how this might run, we're basing our assumptions on the 1991 conflict where a small percentage of the weapons used were precision guided weapons. Now most of them are, so they had the capability to act apparently on intelligence information and seized an opportunity to decapitate, uh, as, as they say in parlance, that, and, uh, and let's hope that it succeeded because uh, one of the prime objectives that's even more important than in 1991 is uh, civilian, civilian casualties being minimized. And if this works, uh, I think it, uh, it could be a major leapfrog forward. And if, in fact, this target of opportunity, and we certainly have no indication it is, but if this target of opportunity, based on intelligence information, is or was Saddam Hussein, does that change the outlook for this war in terms of its duration? Yeah, obviously, but also if it is uh, senior military commanders, it, it can also have a significant effect. Uh, you know, this guy rules by fear, and uh, his 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 hierarchy is based on his family and those who are totally loyal to him. And if you take out some of those people, it can dramatically uh, weaken their military capabilities as well. So obviously, we would hope it would be Saddam Hussein. But if it's his sons or other key members of his command structure, it can still have a significant, significant impact. All right, Senator John McCain, thank you for joining us. And again, if you are just tuning in, you're looking at a live picture from Baghdad where about an hour ago explosions were heard, anti-aircraft artillery fire in the air as the uh, war has begun. The president calling at the opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. I'm Lester Holt at MSNBC World Headquarters. I want to switch to Kuwait now. Brian Williams picks up our coverage. Brian, good morning to you. 
Good morning to you, Lester, and thank you for that. Take a break. Uh, I'm sure we'll be passing each other throughout the broadcast schedule quite this way. Uh, let's uh, begin with uh, a guest uh, to uh, your right, my left, a man who's a retired four-star and most recently in the National Security Council uh, in the Bush White House advising the president on terrorism, but uh, also 12 years ago led men into battle here, uh, uh, former uh, retired General Wayne Downey. General, off the top of your head, what do you think we are seeing here tonight? Well, Brian, I think what we're seeing is just great flexibility in how they're 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 going about this operation. I, I, I think it's exactly right what we're hearing that uh, a target has come up, something that we've acquired through intelligence. Uh, it's a high-value target. Uh, they can certainly end this entire thing right now if they get the right people. To me, it's very, very interesting because uh, I, I was involved in the 1989 operation in Panama, Just Cause, uh, which, was, which had the same objective. It was to uh, eliminate a regime, to, to, to do a regime change on Manuel Noriega a, and his cronies. And in that particular operation, we ran that thing on a D-Day H hour, not on Noriega. And as luck would have it, uh, that night uh, before the operation, the tail that we had on Noriega lost him. So as we went into that operation, we did not know where Noriega was. And of course, it took us four days to chase him down, finally force him into to the Nunciatura, where, where we later uh, took his surrender. So I think what you, you've seen here is we, we learned a lesson from this. Uh, in plain English, and at the risk of being ghoulish about this, uh, he, here's the scene tonight as we went off the air uh, thinking for uh, an entire night. Uh, uh, the, the forces were assembled. They were ready. The, uh, the Secretary of Defense reported back to the President, we're ready to go on your command, sir. Someone, some general in charge of intelligence, uh, a junior officer runs in the room clutching satellite photography or the transcript of an electronic intercept and says, look, there is a car with a suburban in front of it at the corner of Saddam is Great and Saddam is Good Avenues in Baghdad. I think we ought to go. Uh, is, is that as likely a scenario as any? Something like that. Uh, but I will tell you that they had it planned. In other words, that that eventuality might take place. And when it took place, they were prepared to swing, be flexible, redirect that, that precision air power. As Mike Short said, very, very flexible. You can swing this thing as it goes. So this just didn't happen. They went through these scenarios, and I'll bet they had 50 of them lined up. I'm going to uh, interrupt our conversation to uh, join an old friend of yours, uh, the commander of this uh, last effort, General H. Norman Schwarzkopf. General, it's so good to see you again. Thanks for coming on. You're very welcome. Uh, what, uh, what do you uh, make of this tonight, and do you concur with uh, General Downing's uh, assessment? Well, I, I, first of all, I'd always concur with Wayne's assessment. He, he's, he's pretty darn good at what he does, I've got to tell you that. But uh, I would, I, I, my first reaction was complete shock because we all believed that it would begin with a giant attack on downtown Baghdad, and instead it was just this one very, very small operation. But then when you hear why it happened, again, it's amazement that we have that capability. Uh, I, I recall during the Gulf War that in the very, very early stages of the war, Saddam was making a lot of public appearances. And then one night, we almost got him in a convoy. And after that, he went deep underground and stayed there for the remainder of the war. So it might be interesting to see what Saddam is doing tomorrow morning. Now, this uh, stutter start uh, brings us now right into broad daylight. Uh, nothing wrong with air operations in broad daylight, especially with high-tech aircraft. When you hear them, it usually means it's way too late to find them in the sky. But uh, do you think this will be all there's going to be until we get BDA and find out what happened? Yeah, I think that probably uh, all the action has taken place. Uh, they had a target, they went after the target very quickly, and it wasn't within the game plan. I think the game plan is still out there, and it's going to unfold just as, as, uh, as the commander wants it to unfold, taking his time. There's no need to rush it, and make sure that they're ready to go with an all-out attack when, they're, when they've had plenty of time to complete their work. But I think this was just an adjunct uh, thing. It, uh, we probably had planes in the air that were, were 
were really sent on a different mission or were just on a standby orbit and when they found this target, uh, they were able to divert them and send them in and that just shows uh, uh, some of the amazing capabilities that we have. Now, General, w what do you think was happening up along the line uh, 51 miles north of here where the 3rd ID, the Marines, the Brits are all waiting to cross the berm officially? They've been sneaking around incrementally up there. Did they and all other units, you think, hold in place during this thing? Well, I, I think that, you know, they have a campaign plan that they're going to put together. They've got to make sure they're ready to go, and that means they've got to be topped off with fuel. They've got to be topped off with ammunition. Uh, I think that probably D-Day, H-Hour, whatever that might be, is still very much intact. This was just a diversion that took place uh, because the opportunity was there. We've got flashes again, at least we just did about six seconds ago in uh, Baghdad. And, uh, re oh, I'm being told it's uh, pictures from earlier. Uh, uh, General, just what can you learn at the, at the risk of going over some already plowed ground? What can you learn from the ground forces by even flying an American jet over Iraq? Say nothing of uh, half a dozen to a dozen American jets. Well, we have a fantastic capability of, uh, in the air. Uh, far exceeding anything that anybody ever imagined was possible. Uh, we've made great gains in capabilities and, and certainly in the stealth capability and, in, and again in the guided munitions capability. Far greater than anything we had uh, uh, during the Gulf War before. Uh, it just shows that what the fantastic technology that our forces have available to them. But when it gets back down to the infantryman again, he's going to be the man on the ground with a rifle and the bayonet uh, we have a great night fighting capability that we'll probably be using, but in the final analysis, you know, that ground battle is going to be won by people on the ground. General, I have to tell you, commanders I've spoken to in this region uh, keep saying, well, I don't have the war that uh, Norm Schwarzkopf had, uh, had to fight. There's been no invasion here. This is, this is fairly finite. Uh, they think they have it uh, perhaps better than you did. When you think about this, uh, who has it rougher than you did? <laughs> well, I think probably the Special Operations Forces to begin with are going to be called on to do a lot more than, than we were able to. We wanted to use them during the Gulf War. Unfortunately, we didn't. And Wayne well knows that we wanted to use them, but we, we finally got them in there and they did some wonderful things, but that was more towards the end of the war. So the Special Operations folks are going to be doing a lot more. Uh, it's a different mission, don't forget. Our mission was kick Iraq out of Kuwait. That was a very finite mission and with uh, limited in nature. Uh, uh, that was one responsibility. This group here has got an entirely different mission, and that's, if need be, go all the way in, take Baghdad, and get rid of the, uh, the leadership if that's what's required. So I think they got a tougher mission uh, in the long run if they have to do that. General Wayne still saying if you had just used his units, it would have been over in one day. Oh, uh, but I've heard Wayne say that for years and years and years about his outfit. He's a proud yeah. commander. Yeah. Yes, he is. He's also a good uh, NBC News analyst at times like these, and so are you, sir. It's nice to, uh, nice to have you on the broadcast. Thank you very much. What we're going to, what we're going to do is join uh, correspondent uh, Fred Francis. Uh, he is in northern Iraq. He is reporting for National Geographic uh, uh, Observer and is uh, also reporting for NBC News. Uh, Fred, what do you have? But I can tell you for NBC News, uh, Brian, uh, for the last six weeks, uh, we have watched, we have talked to uh, the men that General Wayne Downing trained for so many years who have been operating at will in northern Iraq, uh, 170 miles from Baghdad, uh, Special Operations Forces, Green Berets, and uh, the SOG group, the uh, with far fewer friends than we had in 1991. Clearly the situation is different. In 91, Saddam Hussein had occupied Kuwait. Uh, we've had a difficult time diplomatically. There's divisions within the country and around the world. Uh, civilian casualties would we'd be very important. We minimize them. Uh, and the quicker this conflict is concluded, the better off we'll be. And I think the President was correct to caution us that it, that it could take a long time. That's, that's his job. But I also believe that we can win it quick.
quickly. And uh, these, these young men and women, as you know, and all Americans know, are just superb and they're the best we have to offer, and I'm sure they'll do it well. Senator, you're a military man. You know, you know these, these problems that, that our troops are going to be facing over there, and, and you know that the commanders are worrying over a long list of, of things. What do you see as, as something that might keep them awake? The chemical weapon, the, uh, the the chemical weapon on a Scud missile. Uh, we do have protective equipment, but it's awfully, awfully dangerous when you get into that the, those kinds of weapons. Uh, and that that one scares me. Look, there's no doubt in my mind about uh, our ability to prevail. There's no doubt in anyone's mind. And the question is, is is uh, how much uh, it costs us in the terms of uh, our most precious asset. And the use of a weapon of mass destruction is probably uh, my greatest fear. Second, uh, of course, setting the oil fields on fire is, uh, causes horrendous environmental damage. Uh, it, it would delay the economic recovery of Iraq and ha have other implications. So that's, that's my second fear. Uh, but I, I've always believed, and, and I think that, that it's going to prove out pretty soon that there are very few Iraqi soldiers that want to die for Saddam Hussein. Well, I'll, I'll tell you something that, that, that sits with me, and I would very much like to know what, what you think about mm -hmm. this. As you well know the history of Iraq, essentially after the fall of the Ottoman Empire, after World War I, the British decided to draw a line in the sand, and they didn't do it very effectively. In a tent. <laughs> in a tent. Yeah. And, they, and they put a number of, uh, of groups together that probably is like putting scorpions in a bottle. And, and the question now is, uh, are the centrifugal forces greater than the centripetal ones? Is this a, a country that could go flying apart because of the Shiites and the Kurds and the Turkmans and the Sunnis? Or does it have the real core, as so many of the Iraqi opposition leaders say, that make it a country that it really can become the kind of democracy that uh, President Bush has talked about? I'm totally convinced that they can become a country, and I believe that uh, all of this talk I hear among some elitist, uh, an elite, uh, that uh, somehow Iraq uh, could never achieve democracy and freedom, in my view, is a bit condescending. I believe that the Iraqi people have the same hopes and dreams and aspirations as other people all over the world. I believe they admire respect and want to emulate the United States of America. I think we'll help, help them. I don't think it'll be easy. I would remind you it wasn't so easy for us to achieve the, the goals that we've reached uh, in our democracy as well. But I am confident, and I'm also confident that a lot of other countries, including the Germans, will help us in this reconstruction. Well, there's no, there's no doubt uh, the Iraqi people, I, I've spent a, a fair amount of time with them, and they are wonderful people. They are good-spirited people, and they have long loved the United States, and frankly, they're good business people. The worry, though, uh, that a lot of analysts that I've spoken to have is that there are players out on the borders who might want to engage here and make this a really complicated chess game. you got the Turks who are worried about the Kurds out in the north. You've got Iran, which is Shiite, and, and they've been making friends with the Iraqi Shiites for a while. And you got the Saudis who really would like the minority Sunnis to remain in power, and they're playing their game. So this, this is some complicated political chess. It is, and uh, and and I, I would just make two points. One, uh, that uh, nothing succeeds like success, and all of those countries will give pause after this victory is won. And second of all, it may send a message to these other countries, like the Saudis and the Iranians and others, that uh, democracy is possible, and their people may seek the same kind of liberty and freedom that we're allowing to happen and helping happen in Iraq. What what concerns do you have, sir, about uh urban fighting, which is very possible once they get to Baghdad. I'm not as concerned as some, and I, I, you've, you've got some real good military experts, and I don't presume to tread on their territory. I'm just an old washed up fighter pilot. But, <laughs> but, uh, a little better than that, I think. <laughs> but but uh, house to house fighting requires the most uh, disciplined troops because you don't have the support of other troops around you. I just don't believe that that many uh, Iraqi soldiers are willing to die for him. Uh, clearly, the Republican Guard is of different. The prohibition that was incorporated by President Gerald Ford in 1977 that forbids uh, assassination of foreign leaders in a military kind of environment. When there is a war, 
U.S. government lawyers have determined if you go after the leadership, if you try to kill the uh, command and control leadership in the course of a war, that is not necessarily a violation of that rule, barring assassination. Joining well, me here is Christian Alain Coeur. We've been. I'm sorry. Well, if the White House. Yeah, go ahead. I, I recall uh, uh, perhaps two, three weeks ago, um, Ari Fleischer, in one of the just normal routine press briefings, was asked about this point because there had been a story out there that the president was considering lifting the prohibition. And Mr. Fleischer made it very clear, very clear, that once war starts, all bets are off. Uh, that, that Saddam Hussein right. is as much uh, a target, a legitimate target, as any other military target. He is a military leader in some sense, the commander-in-chief of his armed forces, and he is fair game. And there's no question uh, from the beginning that the United States uh, would very much uh, like to make sure that Saddam Hussein does not walk out of this in any way, shape, or form. Precisely. That's precisely the point I was trying to make, that uh, this uh, effort to try to kill, if you will, Saddam Hussein and the top leadership of Iraq, if in fact that's what occurred during this, these initial cruise missile strikes, F-117A strikes, at these selected targets in and around Baghdad, that would not, according to U.S. lawyers, government lawyers, be a violation of the executive order that was signed uh, by President Ford way back in 1977. Christiana, have you, as you look at what's going on right now, and you've obviously been involved deeply in covering this story as of, as of I always dozen, dozen of years. What goes through your mind? Well, you remember, of course, in the first Gulf War, they did try to get Saddam Hussein. They weren't able to. There was some mis strikes, as you remember, the Amaria shelter, and that led to quite a lot of controversy. But this is not new. Of course, they were trying to go after the leadership, and of course, they want to get him, and they've made that very clear in this instance. I think what's interesting, and perhaps to review a little of what's gone on today already, we had reports throughout the day that the U.S. and British aircraft have already been in action over areas in the no-flight zone, the southern no-flight zone. We're told they took out about 10 or a dozen uh, artillery pieces that could have threatened U.S. and U.K. forces now in the demilitarized zone north of Kuwait and also that could have threatened Kuwait itself. Also, the Pentagon and the have confirmed one of our new service cameras there inside Baghdad and here that is as it happened. And there you go from the F-117s and from cruise missiles, uh, multiple, multiple firings at, to our early knowledge, one target. Though we'll get details from the Pentagon about what that target was and if in fact it was successful at the Pentagon's, uh, in the Pentagon's good time. At this point we can tell you that the campaign against Iraq has begun. And now 10 minutes before 10 o'clock here, let's go to Simon Marks who is live in our newsroom in Amman, Jordan. Simon? Well, Shep, there's one detail uh, about what's occurring in Baghdad that I think tells us a lot about what has happened over the course of the past hour or so. Iraqi state television remains very much on the air and very much still broadcasting patriotic images, images of Saddam Hussein, images of Iraqi fighters and defense forces, and images of protesters who have taken to the streets in Baghdad over the course of the past 48 hours to demonstrate against any war. We know that Iraqi state radio has has been taken off air uh, and apparently seized by the United States military, but it's much easier, of course, to seize control of state radio than it is of state television. The assumption had always been that in the opening d hours of uh, shock and awe, when it gets underway, communications facilities, including Iraqi state television, would be targeted. So the fact that Iraqi television remains on air and is still broadcasting to the Iraqi nation, broadcasting what Saddam Hussein wants the Iraqi nation to see uh, is, I think, a clear indication that this was an attack on a target of opportunity and not the start of a broader salvo against positions uh, inside Baghdad. Here in Amman, as in Baghdad, day has broken. Uh, the attacks occurred very late into the night here, around uh, 4.30 our time in Amman, 5.30 in Baghdad. Many residents in this city told us they were planning to stay up all night and watch television because they had been anticipating uh, that shock and awe would indeed get underway 
overnight. Uh, in a sense, this is going to give the government of Jordan and governments across this region an opportunity now to try and uh, sample public opinion in the light of what appears to have been an attack on a target of opportunity and not the start of that very significant military operation against Baghdad that everyone in this part of the world uh, continues to expect. So we'll be gauging uh, reaction here in Amman over the next few hours and reaction from across the Arab world and continuing to watch those images on Iraqi television waiting to see when they get taken off air. Reporting from Amman, I'm Simon Marks, going to hand it back to Brit Hume now in Washington. Simon Marks, thank you very much. The ever-poised Simon Marks, who has helped Fox News out from many a location around the world. Uh, tonight, of course, the, uh, the attack that was made on Baghdad may have been targeted, it may have been small, it may have been merely a target of opportunity, and not the beginning uh, of the massive assault that has long been expected. However, it was sufficient to call President Bush uh, to the Oval Office to deliver the remarks that it seems clear he had prepared for him to deliver at the time that that assault began. Here is a portion of what the President said just a short time ago. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. More than 35 countries are giving crucial support, from the use of naval and air bases, to help with intelligence and logistics, to the deployment of combat units. Every nation in this coalition has chosen to bear the duty and share the honor of serving in our common defense. I think the key words there, uh, at least in the portion of what the president said you just heard, was have, he said the uh, coalition forces had begun striking selected targets. And then he went on, as you heard, to refer to this as the opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. So the president delivering a statement that he might have prepared uh, for, a, for, a, for a different moment, uh, but nonetheless delivering it. And, and as of now, of course, it appears that the, the campaign is underway. And whether it pauses for a number of hours or at some point resumes, or whether there are further targets of opportunity that US and the U.S. and its allies chose to, choose to act upon obviously remains to be seen. Let us turn now to the man who covers President Bush on a daily basis, our senior White House correspondent, Jim Angle. Jim? We can give you a little bit of detail now about how this day unfolded and when the decision was made. Uh, obviously, the president is having National Security Council meetings a couple of times a day uh, these days. Uh, in fact, we uh, saw the cruise missiles. There are members of the press. So I assume that we will eventually uh, get some sort of report uh, from a, a reporter on one of these ships uh, when the missiles were actually fired. One of the points that you made earlier about uh, uh, the kind of intelligence in Baghdad, uh, part of the strategy of this overall campaign is going to be to break down uh, the ability of the regime to communicate, uh, and by doing so you end up uh, harvesting a, a, a real bounty of intelligence because people who use uh, uh, one type of communications have to come out and use a much more open type that is easier for the U.S. not only to intercept uh, but to triangulate and figure out where it's coming from. But, John, in some respects, what I think confirms for us that this was not <clears throat> the, the, the real opening was the plans that the U.S. has for an astonishing technological attack. Maybe you could describe it for us in brief in order to paralyze Iraqi communications, both civil and military. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I think uh, when the U.S. decides to launch its overall air campaign, uh, it will be obvious and it will be spectacular in some ways, both uh, by the types of technology the U.S. uses, their attempts to be precise, but also extremely lethal on the targets they're going after. I suspect that this uh, early attack, uh, Peter, is going to change at least part of the game plan. Uh, first of all, uh, this evening there was a plan to begin infiltrating special operations forces into various parts of Baghdad uh, to prepare the ground for later ground forces uh, that would move in to specific areas in the north, the western desert, and in fact in some areas in the south. Um, I don't know how that would be impacted, but I can guarantee you uh, that the air patrols over the southern and northern no-fly zones uh, of Iraq uh, are going to change radically in the hours ahead, uh, that the United States will go after many more targets of opportunity now that this war has begun. And, and do you believe, John, again, that, that when the 
the balloon really goes up in a, in a huge way involving the massive amount of planes that they prepare to use. We're going to, to have a sense, uh, perhaps not just in Iraq, but beyond its borders. In some cases, somebody told me all the way to Europe of the electronic ramifications of using some of the weapons that have never been used before. Some, some of the weapons uh, do have that potential, Peter. Uh, those are fairly subtle weapons, actually, that you were talking about. Uh, these are United States becomes offensive uh, in attacking computer systems that could end up affecting banking systems all over Europe and all over the world. Uh, I think the United States has backed off of some of those plans, uh, which is not to say that during the course of this conflict, the U.S. will not be involved. Uh, I think the U.S. will be involved uh, in, in getting into the lines of communication within Iraq uh, telephone systems, computer systems, I can almost assure you uh, that if they are still functioning, the U.S. will be at least monitoring, if not controlling, uh, and providing some false information into those systems. Okay, John, thanks very much. Um, we're trying to bracket the country as best we can. We've, we've been on the southern border with, between Kuwait and Iraq with, with uh, ABC's Ted Couple. Now we can go to the western border, which was Iraq, where Iraq meets Jordan. And ABC's David Wright has been monitoring that border uh, for the last couple of days for us. David, what, if anything, is happening and or do you see from there? Well, Peter, just moments ago, we saw the first signs of air activity in this part of the world. Uh, two uh, small fighter planes flying overhead, something along the size of an F-111, although it's difficult to see from our uh, vantage point here. There's a Jordanian air base not far from where I'm standing that U.S. forces have been using, and when planes take off and land there, we are able to see it. And just to orient you, uh, I am about 350 miles due west of Baghdad. Baghdad is pretty much exactly where the sun is rising behind me. And U.S. forces and other nationals are using this as a staging area to go after targets in the western part of Iraq. Uh, these are thought to be some of the early targets as well because uh, it's from there that uh, Iraq launched Scud missiles at Israel in 1991. David, thank you very much, and thank you everybody else as well. We're going to, uh, c to conclude this uh, particular special report, which... Uh, uh, was designed as much as anything to catch up with what is as happening um, because people uh, were I think generally fairly stunned to see that in a in a in a plan that was uh, so it still is so programmed with so many components to it uh, that the US was flexible enough as we had been told it might be to go after a selected target this evening somewhere in the southern suburbs of Baghdad. We do not know yet what it was. We know what was fired off 40 Tomahawk missiles and a couple of F-117 been hit in what were called targets of opportunity and further we know that at least one of those sites was an attempt to get at the Iraqi leadership whether that specifically included Saddam Hussein or not we don't know and we obviously do not know whether it was successful or not Christian One of the things that President Bush said in his speech tonight was to take note of what he said 35 countries, uh, I think that's what he said, 35, were supporting the United States, whether politically or militarily or with moral support. But of course that has been one of the controversies over this war because there has not been anything like the kind of coalition that was assembled back in 1991. And to go to some immediate reaction that's now coming out of some quarters in the Islamic world, we're seeing on wire reports from Indonesia, from Malaysia and from from Thailand that moderate and conservative Islamic groups are saying that they condemn this attack and that it would lead to more attacks against the United States and of course that is one of the issues that many of the leaders who have been against uh, this war here have warned about that this could increase the incidence of terrorism so we'll wait and obviously closely monitor what comes out of that we have not yet heard any reaction from the Arab world we know that the Arab leaders the Persian Gulf state leaders and other Arabs in this region had basically resigned themselves to war and of course Kuwait and other Persian Gulf states are launching pads for this military action but let's go to Nick Robertson in Baghdad right now and I just want to know Nick uh, whether your Arabic speaking colleagues there have been able to confirm uh, some of what may have been uh, going on on the uh, Iraqi radio there and whether these announcers have in fact uh, changed and whether there's some American military announcers going on there Christian, we have indeed been monitoring those radio stations, and I would like to bring in CNN's Reem Brahimi, who is here with me right now. She has been listening in to those radio broadcasts since uh, the anti-aircraft gunfire started this morning. Let me bring in Reem. 
Good morning. A few uh, messages have been broadcast on uh, Baghdad radio. Uh, first of one, the first one by the president's son, Uday Saddam Hussein, essentially uh, making uh, making a call to all the Iraqis, calling them to protect their leader, saying, "God give us patience. God protect our country from the foreign aggression, and God protect our leader." It was read by a presenter. And it was uh, signed, if you will, uh, Uday Saddam Hussein. A couple of other stations uh, just playing songs, local stations just saying songs, some of them in praise of President Saddam Hussein. The Koran was aired on another one, and another radio was broadcast in Iranian, uh, in Persian uh, language. Now, some of the music has been indeed also broken up by various declarations of uh, resistance, uh, to the uh, foreign aggression, as they call it, pledges of allegiance to President Saddam Hussein, uh, singing, even chanting, Iraq will defend itself with all its might. And just now, we've heard a voice on Iraqi radio. Uh, it seems to be the voice of a Minister of Information, Mohammed Saeed al Sahaf, talking about the battle in which Iraqis will emerge all-powerful, calling on Iraq's sons, members of the Ba'ath Party to have faith, ending almost toward the end, saying, victory is yours, it is certain, it is certain, it is certain. Let me just uh, put back uh, Nick for the, Nick Robertson, our senior international correspondent here for the uh, rest of the coverage here from Baghdad. Christian, indeed, it does appear at this time that uh, U.S. forces have not interrupted any of the radio services, the regular Baghdad radio services that we are able to pick up here at this time. We are obviously monitoring the radio stations here very closely. I think one interesting uh, perspective on this target of opportunity, a targeting President Saddam Hussein, we saw yesterday rumors that uh, Vice, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister Tariq Aziz had perhaps been killed, injured, or had defected. Within half an hour of those rumors being broadcast internationally, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister was appearing on Iraqi television, on international television, talking about a psychological war, saying that there would be, saying that there would be many more rumors like this. This psychological campaign that the Iraqi leadership feels that it is under here is something, uh, a pressure to which it, it does appear to uh, give in to, to a degree, to respond and show that uh, these particular people, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, for example, who have been, who, who have been perhaps rumored to be dead or removed from the country, uh, they seem to want to stop those uh, rumors quite quickly. It will be interesting to see at this time whether or not the Iraqi leader chooses to do the same thing, Christian. Nick, and have you been able to hear over the last couple of hours since this started any of the aircraft activity overhead? I know you spoke about the initial, uh, the initial uh, anti-aircraft fire, but have you heard any American aircraft? Indeed, we, we have not been able to see or hear any aircraft flying over here. There is uh, almost uh, nine-tenths cloud cover over the city, very difficult to see anything. We certainly haven't heard anything. There have been uh, a number of detonations coming from the southern side of the city, perhaps maybe 10, 15 kilometers towards the south side of the city. Difficult to judge the distance, difficult also to judge whether or not this is heavy anti-aircraft batteries or this is some kind of impact. But certainly from what we see in the city at this moment, uh, the anti-aircraft gunfire is not firing in the city at the moment and uh, there is uh, an increased flow of traffic on the streets at this time, although many of the vehicles we see are government vehicles that are moving around at this time, Christian. All right, Nick, thanks, and obviously we'll be back to you. Wolf? Christian, uh, we can now report CNN that uh, we see CNN has confirmed that more than 40 cruise missiles were fired from various locations uh, in the Persian Gulf at these targets of opportunity, as they're called, these two, at least two selected targets uh, that uh, President Bush spoke about. I want to bring in the former Defense Secretary, William Cohen, who served during the Clinton administration, uh, the former Defense Secretary, also a former senator. When you hear of the, this initial burst of, acti of activity, Secretary Cohen, what goes through your mind? Well, several things. Uh, number one, if it was, in fact, uh, a decapitation attempt, 
uh, a target of opportunity as such. It raises certain questions that Saddam will have to take into account. Number one, uh, was the president acting based upon inside information? In other words, are there sources inside of Baghdad close to Saddam Hussein who are feeding information to our intelligence services or saying things that would lead the president to believe that Saddam and his uh, cohorts are going to be in specific location? That should be very disconcerting to Saddam uh, to feel that he uh, may have uh, traitors uh, in his own uh, circle of, uh, of advisors. Uh, number two, uh, it also sends a signal that uh, the uh, the Iraqi forces are going to be subject to uh, uh, attack from uh, great distances that they cannot strike back. That will have a very demoralizing impact. Uh, and uh, number three, I think that uh, the waiting now for the, uh, the rolling thunder or the shock and awe campaign to begin will also have its psychological consequences for those uh, in, in Baghdad and other uh, urban areas. Secretary Cohn, when you hear about this effort to decapitate the Iraqi leadership, that's a euphemism for trying to kill Saddam right. Hussein. Based on your understanding what the executive order is, what the U.S. standing policy is, is that acceptable in this kind of military circumstance? Oh, I think it is. Uh, we are now in a state of war. Uh, Saddam Hussein is the commander-in-chief uh, of the forces that are arrayed against the United States and the Allied forces, and I think that he is a fair game, he and all in the chain of command, as well as all of the soldiers beneath him. So yes, I think that uh, he can and uh, will be targeted to the extent that we have specific information. So uh, the war has begun, and uh, he is uh, the leader of those forces and is subject to, uh, to all attack. Right. And Secretary Cohn, we just sh showed our viewers, and maybe we can show it again. Pentagon has just released some uh, of initial video from this initial burst of uh, strikes uh, against the selected targets in Iraq. We can see it right now. Uh, looks like a cruise missile being launched. Uh, as you well know, these cruise missiles are very accurate. Uh, tell our viewers a little bit about the effectiveness of this cruise missile if, in fact, they were fired at a selected target, a leadership position a command and control facility in Baghdad. How good are these missiles? Uh, these missiles are so precise uh, that uh, they can hit uh, from uh, great distances a target uh, within just a few meters, uh, so-called uh, a circular area of probability. Uh, within a few meters of uh, the target itself, they can uh, strike and, and devastate that target. So they're very, very precise. Uh, they uh, are programmed uh, to hit a specific target and do so uh, almost without fail. Sometimes there are mishaps, sometimes they may go astray, and that is always a concern when you're firing into an urban area, but for the most part they are extraordinarily precise. All right, stand by for one second. I want to bring in our senior Pentagon correspondent, Jamie McIntyre. Jamie, it looked like that videotape that we just saw was a, a cruise missile being launched from a warship. It looked like from a destroyer that was about to go on its target. But what can you tell us about this video? Well, that video was released. This shows one of the difference, Wolf, between now and the Gulf War. That video was taken on one of the U.S. ships that took part in this cruise missile attack. More than 40 missiles were fired. Uh, this was taken on a ship in which uh, U.S. reporters were <laughs> embedded, is the term they keep using. Uh, and it was <laughs> emailed, excuse me, emailed back to the Pentagon and released here a short time ago. So really, just in a short time afterwards, we were able to see the actual launch of some of those 40-plus missiles that were targeted at at least two targets in the Baghdad area. The Tomahawk missile has a range of about 1,000 miles, uh, and it is satellite-guided. Uh, so unlike in the Gulf War, when they had to have terrain uh, <laughs> features to guide by, they can guide these by satellite. They can come in from all different directions uh, and be timed to hit precisely at the same time at one target. So um, that's why it's a weapon of choice here. And again, also F-117s took part in this attack, presumably on one of the other targets. You know, I've heard it often said, and Jamie, I know you have as well, that one of these cruise missiles can be <laughs> fired, let's say, to D.C. Let's say the target is uh, Yankee Stadium in New York City in the Bronx. It can be programmed to go up the eastern coast, go into New York City, go into uh, Yankee Stadium, and actually go in, uh, into center field if, in fact, that is the specific target. It can be that precise. Is that a fair analysis? A absolutely correct, Wolf. And I should have mentioned, by the way, I've neglected to, that this video we have is actually from, uh, you are correct, a uh, U.S. Navy destroyer, the USS Donald Cook one of the ships that took part uh, in the strike tonight. Uh, um, so that's the, uh, that's the actual video that we're showing. 
<laughs> having been aboard those destroyers. When I used to have your job at the Pentagon, I'm familiar with them. That's why it looked like a destroyer. Jamie McIntyre at the Pentagon, thanks very much. Uh, Aaron, back to you. Thank you, Wolf. Just, um, if we can, uh, rack that tape one more time. Um, these are the little moments of history. In fact, someday you will look at this tape and say this is the moment when the war with Iraq, the second Persian Gulf War, the disarmament of Iraq, as the president referred to it, this is the moment it began. These are the pictures to prove it. John King at the White House. John? Aaron, on this very point, you heard both Wolf and Jamie talking about, and Christiane talking about some of the difficulties in the last Gulf War about launching attacks in Baghdad, some civilian casualties that proved quite controversial. One official here in providing some information on the dramatic developments today used this term. He said, this is not his father's military, meaning this president is very confident about the military's capabilities to deliver strikes inside Baghdad while keeping civilian casualties to a minimum. More, a bit of the drama of the president's day. We told you the war planning meetings are now twice a day, but it was at an extraordinary extra meeting late this afternoon after the second war planning meeting. We are told for almost four hours from 3.40 until 7.20 p.m. in the Oval Office, the President, the Vice President, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld, CIA Director George Tenet, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice, they came to see the President urgently because we are told there was concern in the CIA and at the Pentagon that a target of opportunity might be lost. We are told the President actually gave the go-ahead at 6 30 p.m., 50 minutes before that meeting broke up. At 7.20 p.m., after the meeting broke up, he stopped to see his speechwriter, Mike Gerson, his chief speechwriter, to tell Mike Gerson there would be an announcement later tonight, time to get to work. At that point, Mr. Bush left and went to the residence. He had what we are told is a relaxing dinner with the First Lady. At 8 o'clock, Andy Card, his chief of staff, came to say the NSA and the CIA had confirmed Saddam Hussein was still in the country, that he had not accepted the president's ultimatum. Then around 9.30, 9.45, Mr. Bush returned to the Oval Office, put the finishing touches on that speech. 10.15 tonight, in an address to the American people, the President of the United States announcing the war was underway. At this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. The president went on to say the United States would use maximum force to achieve its objectives. One senior official I spoke to a short time ago said the best intelligence information at the moment is a much larger scale operation is still at least 12 hours away in the word of this official. However, he also said the president, as he did tonight, reserves the right to act more quickly if any information comes to his attention. At this hour, Aaron, as we analyze the early hours of this, Mr. Bush has returned to the residence. We are told he is headed to bed. Vice President Cheney, National Security Advisor Rice, also also gone home, but of course the White House situation room, the nerve center here in the west wing of the White House, staffed 24 hours a day because of the advances in technology, in touch with every one of those forces, the deployed forces, every one of those vessels positioned around the Persian Gulf. Aaron. Yeah, John, in terms of the news, is the lid on now at the White House? Has the, has the uh, information lid gone down? Yes, it had. We are told no new announcements from the White House at all tonight, and there are no public events on the president's schedule tomorrow. He does have dinner tomorrow night with a member of this coalition of the willing, if you will, and if we want to flash back a few days, one of the contested votes on the United Nations Security Council, the president of Cameroon, is due to be here tomorrow night to have dinner with the president. We will see how tomorrow unfolds. Uh, in so many respects, John, we'll see how tomorrow unfolds. Thank you, Senior White House Correspondent John King. Just a quick point on something John mentioned uh, at the beginning of his reporting there. Uh, it is a very different military than the first Gulf War. It is a much smaller force that is in the region, but it is it has much smarter, if you will, much smarter weapons than it had, far more smart bombs, and the smart bombs themselves are much more sophisticated, many satellite GPS-guided weapons. Uh, it allows the military to be far more precise and to operate, it hopes, certainly that's the battle plan, far more successfully with fewer people, uh, fewer people on the ground, fewer foot soldiers, and 
and, the, and, and it, it stands to reason then fewer risks of casualties. But as the White House also made clear today, Americans need to pre prepare themselves for the possibility of casualties as this unfolds. One of the concerns is that there will be a flood of refugees, people trying to get out of Iraq. It's, we have seen some of that in both the north, particularly in the north, but some in the south as well. Jane Araf is in northern Iraq and has seen some of that along the Turkish border. Jane? Aaron, we're overlooking the city of Dohuk behind us, and our location actually is Dohuk is one of the biggest cities in northern Iraq. As you mentioned, they've seen a flood of people here, not the refugees they expected. Those potential refugees would have been coming from the rest of from the rest of Iraq. These ones actually are Kurds moving into the mountainside that has caused what humanitarian officials say here is a crisis. Two people have already died of exposure. Now, the city is at the foot of a mountain. The mountain overlooks the, it looks towards Mosul, Iraq's second biggest city, and there are Kurdish military there. Select groups of American military are known to operate. They're there this morning, apparently. And just a few kilometers away is actually the checkpoint where any potential refugees would come over, as well as surrendering Iraqi soldiers. We were there early this morning at the checkpoint that divides Iraqi-controlled territory with Kurdish-controlled territory. The border guards are monitoring the border, but they haven't seen anyone cross yet. But officials here have made preparations for thousands of soldiers coming across, as well as tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of refugees. Aaron? And just give me a sense of how far you are from the border with Turkey, and talk about the concerns that both sides of that border, the Turks and the Kurds, have about that piece of real estate that you're standing on. That had been very much a concern, as you know, the prospect that Turkey would send Turkish troops into northern Iraq, Iraqi Kurdistan. That seems to have been diffused somewhat. Now, we have been up in the mountains with the Kurdish Peshmerga. Peshmerga, those who face death, they're legendary fighters. And in the past two weeks, as soon as Turkey started seriously talking about sending troops into northern Iraq, these fighters were deployed. We saw five battalions of them, about 5,000 fighters deployed in the mountains directly near Turkey. Now, the United States has been trying to play a mediating role, as you know, Aaron, trying to make sure that things do remain calm, that there's no conflict here. And the Kurds believe that they have an agreement that Turkish forces will not be deployed. Now, Turkey has said it needs to deploy these people to prevent any humanitarian crisis, to stem a wave of refugees. People here, Kurdish officials say, thank you very much. They can handle that quite well themselves. Aaron? Jane, thank you. Jane Araf, who is in uh, um, Kurdish-controlled part of northern Iraq. It is the one part of Iraq that Saddam and his regime uh, has not controlled. Uh, it is a very complicated ethnic political situation in that part of the country that, as Jane indicated, impacts Iraq, impacts Turkey on the other side. It was very much part of why this negotiation with Turkey was so complicated. Uh, the, uh, and even uh, uh, as recently as yesterday, the United States government made clear that it would not look kindly on Turkey if Turkey sent its troops into that area. But both sides, the Kurds and the Turks, um, have a difficult relationship, and that is one part of why the ultimate occupation and the recreation of Iraq is going to be such a complicated and expensive and likely long-term enterprise for the United States. Nick Robertson in Baghdad. Nick, what do the people of Baghdad know? What have they heard from either their government or anyone else to this point? Well, there was a brief broadcast earlier on by... Uh porque siempre es sin escoge. Lunes a domingo a las 11:30 de la noche 10:30 operation with a few of our friends or should it be uh, I'm talking about the non-security part of it should it be civilianized into a multinational regime that is approved by the UN it's up to President Bush right now all he should be thinking about is that war but it's not too early to raise the fact that there are vast issues involved here and even the quickest victory militarily will not guarantee that America will be universally loved or admired unless they they have in Churchill's famous phrase after World War II, in victory magnanim magnanimity. All right. Sandy, speak finally to this issue of, of this feeling of, of arrogance of power by the United States. Uh, another element of it is that, you know, the fear of the United States and, and what we might do next, and that this victory, uh, if it comes and if it is on the best effort, successful and quick, 
will give some impetus to the idea that we ought to set do more. Well, let me start off by, by paraphrasing Mae West. Uh, you know, we've been weak and we've been strong, and it's better to be strong. Uh, so I don't think we have to apologize for our strength. But I think the fact is that we are engaging in this war in a very divided world um, and uh, have not been able to build a broad coalition, as I think many of us uh, hope that we would. Uh, in part, I think that uh, derives from the way in which we have related to the world, not so much, not only uh, unilaterally, but unidimensionally. Yeah. Uh, and I think that there are essentially now, as we go forward, th really three dimensions to this war on terrorism of which Iraq is a part. One is offense, which we're seeing tonight. The other is defense, protecting the homeland. And the third is the war of ideas. Right. And the war of defining what America stands for. And America stands not only for the use of force for our self-protection, it also stands for the use of our authority to promote a broader common agenda. I think we've fallen down on that in the last two years, on peacekeeping, on closing the gap between rich and poor, on the global environment. Those are all issues that are now security issues because they create a more bitter and divided world, but they are also issues uh, that are part of the war on terrorism as well. And there, because there are issues that, that define us, whether or not we're going to isolate the extremists or whether we're going to isolate ourselves. So it is all the more important, it seems to me, when we are completed with this war successfully, which has to be our thorough preoccupation, keeping an eye on North Korea, by the way, in, uh, as we go forward. But when we're done with this, we have to as well, uh, we have to re-engage in the world and make clear to the world that America stands not only for self-protection, not only for power in the military sense, but for using our moral authority toward a shared agenda uh, with us and the rest of the world. I think it's extraordinarily important. Sandy, thank you very much for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to have you in the broadcast. Hope we can do this again. Uh, I should say before I good night, Richard, that on this program uh, and in future programs, we will be talking about the role of America in, in, in the world and also some of these issues come out. Now the focus uh, primarily is what ought to be done in the reconstruction and, and, and concerns about the safety of America uh, and national security interest. Uh, but Richard, on this program, uh, argued with me, I mean, or made the point uh, several weeks ago that uh, a second resolution um, might not be the direction that America would go in, a realization that the administration came to later. Thank you for joining me. Good to be here, Charlie. Pleasure to have you. Jim Hoagland, thank you for joining us. Charlie, how are you? What do you think uh, on this night of beginning a war with Iraq? Well, I wanted to come back to a point that Sandy and Dick both touched on, but I wanted to amplify a little bit on. Uh, and it's the question, really, that they tended to leave out the Iraqi people in the question of who is going to be in charge of Iraq. I think it's extremely important that the administration turn quickly to an interim Iraqi authority, that they begin dealing with Iraqi opposition leaders who have been outside of the country and those who've stayed inside. They're going to have to cooperate to some extent with people who are in place in the government, civil servants, and in, even in the army. But they have to have a free Iraqi force to which they can turn over some of the administration and very quickly to establish credibility. Do you think they have identified those people yet or will that come, you know, has military uh, preoccupation necessarily uh, restricted a consideration of understanding who's available there within the country uh, in addition to those people who have left Iraq to perform opposition groups outside of the country? I think they have some pretty strong ideas. There is already in, in existence a 65-member coordination committee of the Iraqi opposition. It really spans the spectrum. Uh, they have identified, that is, the Iraqis in this committee, part of whom have been in northern Iraq, uh, in the House a short while ago said it could be yet another 12 hours before the command comes for these troops to move forward. That looks very accurate from where we are. We would probably take two to three hours to move even now, and we're the leading edge. We're the cutting edge. Uh, that is, the 7th Cavalry is the cutting edge here. Uh, so it'll be at minimum two to three hours before we could roll forward, even if the command came now. And then beyond that, uh, John King was speculating 12 hours. That looks fairly realistic. Over the horizon in that direction, uh, back to the south, 
is the huge uh, 3rd Infantry Division, mechanized infantry with, with uh, hundreds of tanks, um, uh, 155 millimeter Paladin guns. They have yet to be brought up. The 7th uh, Cavalry, the unit with which I've been embedded, is the scouting unit. We would be the first out uh, into Kuwait when, or excuse me, into Iraq, departing Kuwait. But again, the order has not been given to cross the line of departure. 7th Cavalry remains in its attack position, which is stationary. Aaron? Uh, just, Walt, as briefly as you can, when you walked over to these troops, when you walked over to them and told them what we had been reporting, that the, the strikes had happened, that the war apparently was on, how did they react? They were sort of dumbfounded, you know, sort of scratched their heads like, why didn't somebody tell us? Again, that's not their position to get the, the overall, the big strategic picture, which you're reporting so well back there. But our position here is very tactical. That is to say, these units, when they go forward, see only a very small tactical picture. An immediate objective, they follow a roadmap, and the roadmap for the 7th Cavalry is up to Baghdad. But again, uh, there's no indication, they had no indication this was coming, and even the officers in this unit were unaware of what was happening before you were reporting it to that big CNN audience. Aaron? Well, thank you. Walt Rogers in the desert, and we'll be seeing him a lot in the days ahead, we're certain. Um, much is now starting to unfold, though perhaps not all of it out uh, out on the water. The USS Lincoln, um, Kira Phillips is one of the embedded reporters out there. Uh, we're trying to get the pictures in. You can see the fighter jets. Um, there's some breakup, obviously. These are live pictures, and this is complicated technology. Um, Kira, are you able to hear me? Brian, or uh, Eric, can you hear me, Eric? Yeah, we, we are able to hear you barely. Go ahead. It's hard to see them, but we. There we go. Did you see there that we area? did. We were able to see it there, and all we can do and say, and we know we speak for everyone, is we wish them safe flight and safe return. Kira, thanks. Nick Robertson in Baghdad. Nick. Aaron, indeed, just while we've been talking in the last few minutes, an announcer has appeared on Iraqi television saying that President Saddam Hussein will make an address to the nation, will make a speech in the next few minutes. The announcer has made that announcement several times in the last few minutes. It seems at this stage uh, the Iraqi government responding very quickly to the notion that this decapitation uh, attempt on the Iraqi leader, this target of opportunity, um, was unsuccessful. We are expecting that. That's what Iraqi television is telling its people at this time, to expect an announcement in the next few minutes from the Iraqi leader. We are watching the television here, and as soon as it happens, Aaron, we will bring you all the details. Well, and it's, it is important for a couple of reasons. It is important for the anyone in Iraq uh, who might have designs on um, defecting, on surrendering, on uh, not fighting a war that's about to unfold, to know that Saddam Hussein and his leadership, this most feared of people, that his government is still intact and, and that there are consequences it, uh, perhaps awaiting. Um, and it's important, I suppose, for the Iraqi people to know that as well, that the government, whatever they may think of it, that the government of Iraq is still in place and this decapitation effort, whatever it was, was not um, successful in an absolute sense. That is to say, if, if in fact Saddam Hussein appears on television and if it was designed to get him um, and if in fact these were not taped pictures, then uh, he is still alive. But we'll know that. We'll know that in 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, whenever he uh, goes on TV uh, and will translate what he has to say um, when he 
when he does. Uh, Wolf is, I, I think you want me to do this, Wolf is in uh, Kuwait. Wolf. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, I want to do a little bit more analysis now on the weaponry that was used in this initial attack against the selected targets in Baghdad, apparently, perhaps elsewhere as well. Joining us, our CNN.